He could not accept the fact that I said no. He couldn't accept the fact that a medical expert had turned him down. You want to know what I had to tell him and why I would not allow him to speak to my medical expert? Come join me for a walk near the beach as I share with you the answer to that question. I am Jerry Oginski. I'm a New York medical malpractice and personal injury attorney. All right, this was a gentleman who had come to me claiming that his doctor was careless and caused him significant harm and injury. He knew in his heart of hearts that he had a valid case. He knew because someone had told him, had whispered in his ear and said, listen, I think you have a great case. You should speak to an attorney. He knew that something bad had occurred to him and he didn't understand why. He also believed very, very firmly that the injuries that he suffered were a direct result of his doctor's carelessness. Now, listening to him at the very beginning, it certainly sounded as if something had gone wrong. It certainly sounded as if something might have been done wrong to cause him these various injuries and disabilities and complications that he had, clearly that he had, following this treatment and following this procedure. So I went ahead and actually obtained all of his medical records. And that's a requirement in New York in order to evaluate whether someone has a valid medical malpractice case. We are required to actually obtain all of the necessary medical records and then hire a board certified medical expert to review all those records. And the expert is really looking for three things. They're looking to see, number one, did the doctor depart from the standard of care? And if he did, was that departure, that carelessness, a cause of his injury? There has to be that connection, a link between the wrongdoing and the injury. And then we have to see whether or not the injuries are significant or permanent or both. In that instance, if all three elements are present, then I can come back to my client and say, okay, our medical expert has confirmed that you do in fact have a meritorious case and now we can proceed forward and start a case on your behalf. However, if my medical expert comes back and says, out of those three things, we only have one or two, but not all three, guess what? Then I cannot ethically and legally proceed forward with a case on your behalf. So my expert actually went through all of those records. It took him many, many weeks to go through all those records. Then we had an extensive conversation detailing his thoughts, opinions, and importantly, his conclusions. And in this particular case, the expert was on the fence about whether or not there was liability, meaning he wasn't entirely sure whether this doctor who was treating my client departed from the standard of care. Instead, he said in all likelihood, this was a judgment call where multiple physicians, had multiple physicians been involved and been presented with this scenario, a number of them would say, I would do A, B, and C. Others would say, no, I do X, Y, and Z. As long as both options, both alternatives were within the standard of care, then choosing to do one set of options as opposed to another would not be a violation from the standard of care or a departure from the standard of care. In that instance, that's what's known as a judgment call. And that does not rise to the level of being malpractice, which would mean that we can't show and establish the very first element needed to show that we have a valid case. Even more interesting was that the medical expert that I hired said, look, even if we were able to show that the doctor was careless, that he departed from the standard of care, there is no link between the wrongdoing and this patient's injuries. I said, okay, explain that to me. And he began to explain in detail how this client's, this patient's injuries came about. And the more he explained, the more I began to understand that it had nothing whatsoever to do with whatever claimed mistreatment he received from this particular physician. It was clear as day. And I knew at that moment that my client did not have a valid case. So now I get on the phone with my client and I begin to explain to him why I won't be able to help him. He is adamant. He refuses to accept my answers. He refuses to accept the fact that he does not have a case. And now he's extremely defensive. He is arguing with me. He's trying to explain away and justify every little thing that occurred during the course of his treatment. And I said to him, why are you arguing with me? I am relying on my medical expert. Without a medical expert, I cannot legally go forward with the case. And you know what he said to me? Go hire another expert. 
I said, in this instance, if I thought that there was the potential that another expert might validate your particular case, then I would have no hesitation to going ahead, laying out additional funds, additional money to hire another expert. However, in this case, I see no other explanation, no other feasible explanation that would allow us to proceed forward. And instead of acknowledging and accepting the fact that this medical expert said he didn't have a case, he said, who is this medical expert? What are his qualifications? As if my client could somehow judge and evaluate a medical expert's qualifications. So he started asking me all these questions about my expert's qualifications, which he clearly had no idea how to evaluate. Then, you know what he said? He said, I want to speak to your expert. Now, there may be some attorneys who say, okay, that sounds like a great idea. But instead, you know what I said? I'm sorry, that's not possible. My expert does not talk to the client because doing so, you might influence him. You might cause him to change his opinion. You might alter his trajectory of what he thinks occurred. Now, couldn't that be a good thing, you're asking? Well, the answer is no, it couldn't be a good thing. And importantly, if this case were to go forward, now my client would be questioned during a process known as a deposition during the course of his lawsuit to answer questions about what occurred to him and what injuries he suffered and what problems he has now. During the course of the deposition, as well as a trial, the opposing lawyer can ask my client if he ever spoke to our expert. And we don't disclose those details to the defense until much later at the time of trial. And then, if he answers yes, you know what happens? Now it opens up a whole big can of worms. Now he's going to go ahead and have to divulge information about conversations he had with my expert. I don't ever want that to occur because the moment he does, now we've got problems. More importantly, I don't want my expert being bullied. And that's exactly what was going to occur if I allowed this witness who was refusing to acknowledge that he didn't have a case, now to go ahead and speak to my medical expert, someone who's making a decision based upon the medical records only, not upon whether somebody's convincing him, not upon whether or not someone's trying to coerce him into changing his opinion, but rather, the, based upon the evidence, which is the evidence that this entire case is going to be based upon. Nothing else, just what is contained in the medical records. Now you might be asking another interesting question, which is, well, isn't it important for the expert to know about what my client went through, about conversations that he may have had? And the answer is yes. However, to get there, we have to first get over the hump of having my expert confirm based upon the medical records that in fact there is a valid case. If my expert feels that there is a valid case, and during the course of the lawsuit, my client will be questioned, and later on, I will then give a copy of my client's pretrial testimony to my expert to evaluate, to review. And that will either reinforce his opinions or have no effect whatsoever. And you know what, in some instances, it may change my expert's opinion to an unfavorable position. And if that were to occur, now we have even bigger problems. So why do I share this quick information with you? I share it with you to open your eyes to help you understand how these types of cases work in the state of New York. You know, I realize you're likely watching this because you have questions or concerns about your own matter. Well, if your matter did happen in New York and you are thinking about bringing a lawsuit, but haven't done so yet because you still have questions that need to be answered, what I invite you to do is pick up the phone and call me. You know I answer questions like yours every single day and I'd love to chat with you. You can reach me at 516-487-8207 or by email at jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, at oginski-law.com. That's it for today's video. I'm Jerry Oginski. Have a wonderful day.